Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And Fallout 4's Nuka World DLC occupies a special place in my heart. Standing right alongside Skyrim's Dragonborn and Fallout 3's Point Lookout as among my favorite Bethesda-made expansions ever. Immersing soul survivors into the chaotic environment that is an irradiated, raider-occupied theme park, Nuka World shined with a variety of creative locations, a colorful cast of characters, and a narrative that transformed most of us from heroes into political cutthroats. It was quite the experience. This theme park was so large in scope that even today, nearly three years after her introduction to players in August of 2016, there's still likely a number of easter eggs, clever references, and brilliant bits of environmental storytelling that much of the community never picked up on. So, pop open an ice-cold beverage, set your Mr. Handy to Do Not Disturb mode, and settle in, as we dive right into five Nuka World DLC secrets you may have missed in Fallout 4. Starting off, the vault Among the Stars attraction opened up in Nuka World's space-themed region of the park, the Galactic Zone, as a part of a sinister collaboration between the Nuka-Cola and vault companies. While presenting itself as just another fun exhibit and a ride for families to enjoy themselves in, within the attraction, vault staff were instructed to manipulate guests into purchasing spots in vaults through a combination of fear-mongering and laughably false promises. But that's just scratching the surface. It gets a lot worse. Aside from evil marketing, vault also used the Among the Stars attraction to conduct radiation and electromagnetic-based experiments on both its guests and regular employees. There's a small catalog of terminal entries we can find on a computer within an employee's only room of the attraction. They were written before the war by an employee named Jay Hodgson, the head operations engineer for the entire ride, who notably was kept totally in the dark about the experiments the company was testing. In these terminal entries, he reports that himself and his staff had been experiencing extreme headaches, nosebleeds, and more since the exhibit's opening. As the diary logs continue, they span the course of a few months, it only gets worse. Mr. Hodgson describes guests suffering from the same symptoms as his colleagues, and sometimes collapsing randomly. He mentions a great frustration with the fact that vault medical staff on site insist it's all just some sort of heat sickness and nothing more. We of course learn on other computers that the med staff was in on it. Hodgson's final entries seem to suggest all hell breaking loose, as people have gone from showing weird symptoms to going downright mad. Families are running out screaming, people are randomly stripping down to their undergarments, he finds himself suffering from extreme memory loss, it's really gotten bad. Hodgson develops his suspicions, but he never really confirms them, and the terminals sort of end on this little bit of a cliffhanger. But I digress. Pay attention to that vault staffer's name, Jay Hodgson. It's actually a reference by Bethesda to a real-life person, Joel Hodgson, creator of the sci-fi comedy show Mystery Science Theater 3000, which he also casted himself in. In the show, Joel played a man trapped aboard a satellite by two mad scientists who desired to conduct experiments on him, not tremendously unlike his Fallout 4 namesake. There's little more to point out about this. Just know that someone on Bethesda's writing staff seems to have been a big fan of MST3K. Next on our list, we head out to the Safari Adventure region of the park, an area where beautiful displays of vegetation and African-inspired wildlife that once wowed visitors over 200 years ago have since been transformed by centuries of radiation exposure into a total nightmare. The central plot that defines the Safari Adventure when we visit it revolves around the work of a now-long-dead scientist by the name of Darren McDermott. 
You see, before the Great War, Dr. McDermott led a small cloning laboratory located beneath the safari section of the park. Their work was ultra-classified, but they used their cloning devices to produce most of the animals that would go on to populate the park. After the bombs fell, Darren McDermott found himself the only survivor, and for the next couple hundred years, he was able to do quite well for himself. The man ghoulified, radically slowing down his aging, and kept himself busy by conducting an assortment of new experiments with his still-functioning cloning technology, now free from any Nuka-Cola supervision. Eventually, as the decades became centuries, the doctor began to find scavengers popping up all throughout the park. So, in a desperate attempt to keep them away and keep himself protected, he created the Gator Claw a lizard-like genetic monstrosity meant to defend the park that he started pumping out by the dozens via that cloning tech. However, in some Frankenstein-like irony, his creations turned on him and murdered him to death. Now, more and more Gator Claws are still being cloned, infesting the safari adventure, and threatening the very survival of the park if you can't stop this. Now, of course, as you can probably imagine, you will end up shutting off the replicator and saving the day, following a short quest that's basically just a dungeon crawl alongside a primitive man named Sito, it's a long story. Anyway, what you may not have known is that it seems Bethesda, at one point or another, likely intended for this quest to go a lot differently than the way it ultimately turned out. As in the game's files, there's in fact an NPC for Dr. Darren McDermott. He can even be spawned into Fallout 4 through the use of console commands, implying that despite not existing in the final release, Bethesda seems to have wanted him to be a character who could interact with the sole survivor. Perhaps their original vision for the quest would have seen a still-alive McDermott enlist the player's help in dealing with the Gator Claw problem he created. Or maybe they just wanted to use his corpse for something. Though I find that unlikely, as he does have faction allegiances attached to his NPC data, which is uncommon for automatically dead characters. Whatever his true, original purpose in Fallout 4 was going to be, we may never know. Perhaps only the walls of Bethesda's offices hold the true answers. Coming in at number 3, the player's introduction to the Nuka World Amusement Park, and indeed the entire DLC itself, will come after a radio transmission leads the Vault Dweller to an old transit center, where a wounded wastelander named Harvey can be found lying next to a train that leads to the park. Harvey will explain that he's recently escaped from the nightmare of an amusement park that is Nuka World, desperately fighting his way through raiders to get here. But his family is still back there, and he'll ask you to hop on the train and go save them. This will be how we first end up traveling to the new location. Now, as players with good charisma will learn through passing a couple of speech checks, or any player will learn by simply progressing a bit deeper into the expansion storyline, Harvey's full of nonsense. He didn't just escape Nuka World, and he doesn't have a wife and kids he wants you to go rescue. He's actually working with the park's leading raider gangs to lure unsuspecting travelers to the region. He's not exactly a totally bad guy. Long ago, he used to live at Nuka World as a free man, but when the raiders came to the theme park and enslaved all of the locals, they forced Harvey to start doing this tricking people to going into the park, and threatened to hurt those he cared about if he refused. And again, if you're too nice to him during your first meeting, the dude will just throw the towel in and admit everything to you, saying it's not right to let someone as kind as your character go to a place like that unknowingly. So yes, he's doing a bad thing, but he's not a terrible human being, and definitely not nearly as sadistic as some of his associates. Well, this first meeting with Harvey, believe it or not, doesn't have to be your last. As after you've gone to the park and are declared the new raider over boss, the next time you're out in the Commonwealth, and mind you, the Commonwealth proper, not Nuka World, 
Harvey will become the subject of a possible random encounter, where we can find him on a roadside, apparently trying to trick more unsuspecting Wastelanders into heading on over to Nuka World. When we first approach him, he'll at first mistake us for just another wanderer, but quickly realize his mistake and recognize the sole survivor as the new overboss. Also making a strong point of apologizing for getting you into this whole mess in the first place, and explaining his own unfortunate situation. Remember, he doesn't really want to be doing this. Oh, thank god. The raiders have my fam- Oh, hey boss. Just wanted to say, no hard feelings. Alright? You were in on this? Yeah, pretty much. But it's not what you think. I mean, it's- it's just I didn't really have any choice in the matter. You lied to me. I know, and I'm sorry. But if you ever cared about anyone, you'd do the same thing. From here, you've got a few options. A. Refuse his apology and attack him for what he did. B. Sort of just blow him off. C. Accept the apology. Or D. Not only accept his apology, but also free him telling Harvey he's no longer obligated to lure in new wastelanders, and is free to go on and make something of himself. Harvey, for his part, will obviously be ecstatic upon hearing this news, and will utter some enormous thanks, before running off into the sunset with a giant grin on his face. Why do you stick around and keep doing this? Guess that's all I'm good at. Since I fooled you, the gang leaders seem to think I've got some sort of special talent suckers. Well, I'm the overboss, and I say you're free to go. You, you're serious, aren't you? I ain't gonna say no, and believe me, it'll be a cold day in hell if you see me in the Commonwealth again. It's actually a pretty cool moment if you understand all the context. Maybe Nuka World isn't always about being the bad guy after all. At least one person will have some good come their way, thanks to your actions back at the park. Assuming you chose to help them, that is. For fourth spot, Oswald the Outrageous is the ghoulified protector of Nuka World's Kitty Kingdom section. Prior to the Great War, he was a magician at the theme park, entertaining children with a variety of awe-inspiring magical illusions. After the bombs fell, he, much of Kitty Kingdom's staff, and many visitors were able to find shelter in some tunnels located beneath the kingdom. It unfortunately didn't take very long for those survivors to begin to fall victim to radiation poisoning, however. And one by one, they started dropping like flies, or ghoulifying and going totally feral. This was a really hard experience for Oswald. A lot of these people that started to ghoulify, he had been surviving alongside for months. They had become sort of like his family, so to watch them go into this terrible state was just something he couldn't really handle. Oswald himself, while he did not only ghoulify, but become a glowing one, somehow managed to retain his cognitive faculties, and didn't go mad, effectively leaving him as the last man truly standing in all of Kitty Kingdom. Now, he spends his days developing and maintaining a variety of elaborate traps and defenses meant to keep the raiders away from the kingdom believing that one day, he might be able to find a cure, and save all of the land's current feral ghouls. But until then, they must be protected. Personally, he's one of my favorite characters in the entire Fallout universe. I feel as though he combines a creative backstory, pure but misguided intentions, and incredible effectiveness to be one of the game's strongest NPCs. Eventually, most players will end up either murdering the poor guy to death, or talking him down and helping him realize the error of his ways, before disabling the region's defenses and allowing human settlement back into Kitty Kingdom. But his story aside, Oswald's very own name yet again seems to be another real-world reference by Bethesda. In a few terminals we can find near the Playhouse, it's revealed that Oswald's full name is Oswald Oppenheimer. This seems to be a nod to Julius Robert Oppenheimer, an American theoretical physicist best known for his leading role in the Manhattan Project, the creation of the first atomic bomb. 
You may have heard the famous quote, I am become death, destroyer of worlds, before in media. That was coined by Dr. Oppenheimer following his work on the bomb. In fact, Nick Valentine even mutters those exact words in the Far Harbor DLC. If the player chooses to destroy the children of Adam's HQ by activating the nuclear submarine inside of its nuclear payload. Additionally, originally that was going to be the only Oswald related fact, but here's a bit of a bonus one. While we're still talking about him, if you approach the magician while wearing a full set of power armor, he may say this, alluding to the Wizard of Oz. What's wrong, Tin Man? Having trouble finding the wizard? Personally, I would have figured you for the Scarecrow. So it looks like the folks over at Bethesda had a good bit of fun while crafting this oh-so-intriguing character. And finally, last on our list, this one is likely the most well-known of all the details we've covered so far, as it quite rightfully made a pretty positive mark on the community around the time the DLC first dropped, but in a video like this, I think it absolutely has to be mentioned. Evan is a man living in an isolated cabin slash trailer just south of the Nukatown, USA portion of the park. He's an especially unique character, notable for the incredible amount of just genuine kindness that'll show towards the player. His dialogue is exceptionally welcoming, and he'll even give the sole survivor a recipe book to craft Nuka Love, a special variant of Nuka Cola, for free. Well, Evan's character is in fact not only a reference, but more of a tribute by Bethesda to the author of a Reddit post's brother. You see, back in late June of 2016, u/newj47 created a thread on the r/fo4 subreddit, largely to thank Bethesda for providing him and his brother Evan with so many positive memories. Unfortunately, at the time the thread was originally created, Evan was in the hospital and would go on to pass away shortly after the post went up which the author provided some updates on. Well, this Reddit post caught Bethesda's attention, and they sent NewJ47 a large care package, as well as a heartfelt letter. And when the Nuka World DLC finally did go live, they attributed the character you see and we're talking about to Evan. Pretty cool. This whole thing unfolded only a few days before the DLC itself actually went live. So Bethesda likely had to rush to get the character added to the game and voices dialogue. It's a pretty cool gesture by the developers. I'll try to include some links in a pinned comment down below so you can read the whole Reddit thread yourself and see what the author had to say. YouTube can get a little bit sketchy with links, but I think we'll probably be okay. Anyway. It's neat that Evan's memory has been immortalized in one of his favorite games. And with that, we are going to wrap up my top five Nuka World DLC secrets in Fallout 4. Thanks for stopping by, everybody. Nuka World is a pretty big expansion, and there are definitely a few Easter eggs and little references here and there that I just couldn't fit in today. So hopefully we can do a part two sometime in the future. Or I'll just find a way to incorporate all those into a more general 10 tiny details video. Anyway, thanks again for watching. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.